But when we first arrived, the plane came into Cameron Bay, and the plane was full. There must have been a hundred of us, and, and just about everybody was individual replacements, so there was no units at the <coughs> Excuse me. And they had a runway, then they had barracks, and the sand was white, and it was so deep that they laid down uh, that uh, metal track they used to land aircrafts on. Aircraft, and that's where you walked around. You had to stay on the metal track because the sand was so fine, you sink in the sand. And uh, yeah, the whole thing was sand, and uh, I never forget over on uh, one corner of it, they had uh, empty artillery casings. And there must have been thousands of them, and it was brass, and I suppose they brought it back to them and recycled it or whatever. But it was hot. It was uh, really, really hot. And then they assigned us to a barracks and said we'd be there a day or two. And uh, some people shipped the same day, and, and like I say, it was a day or two. And then you had to go through customs, because I remember I had a little bottle of vodka I got on the airplane. Before I got on the airplane, because you weren't allowed to take booze. And when you go through customs, they took everything away from you. And uh, you didn't have pictures, you didn't have anything. And then uh, you had just your equipment, and you went and got in this barracks, and then uh, they told you when you were, they were going to try to ship you, and then, like I told you earlier, when they tried to, they were going to ship me up to Pleiku, which was in the Central Islands, and uh, they had to cancel because they had incoming on the runway, so they couldn't get, they could, I think there was three of us, and they couldn't get us in. And then a uh, day or two after that, we flew up in a C-130 and landed in Pleiku. Sun was shining, the guards were either sleeping or, or bathing out there in the sun, and it was just like, a big resort, and then from there you went to your unit, your individual units, and I was about four or five miles from the the Air Force you know, on Artillery Hill, and then the other two, I think one went to Fourth Division, and I don't know where the other one went, but uh, and that's that's and I was replacing. Matter of fact, I was replacing a guy from South Dakota by the name of Smitty, and he was getting ready to go home, so. So it didn't feel that great, I'll tell you. He was going home and I was just coming, so. But. We had, uh, we lived in sandbag huts, and they were, uh, you had to stoop down to get into them and bend over because they weren't very high, because they had to be lower than what the gun would shoot over the top of. So they'd be, they'd be, Probably as high as the parapet that the gun was surrounded by, because they was always built. They were always built right next to the gun, and they were probably not over. Well, were probably about three foot high on the inside, so you'd kind of bend over and crawl into them. But they were sandbag walls, sandbag ceilings, and uh, we had cots, so it's uh, mosquito nets, and uh, you'd be keep help keep the mosquitoes and the rats off. Yeah, uh, a couple of times, you know, we were walking along the trail and the uh, next thing you know, they open up on you and your first instinct is to hit the ground and find cover and find out where they were and return fire. And the first time it happened, uh, when we were, we were following a blood trail where uh, they had told us that there was some wounded uh, in the a &N area and we were uh, checking it out and we come under fire and they were lobbing, lobbing grenades down on it. That's why I got my first Purple Heart because shrapnel was going everywhere and I got hit in the leg. And uh, but we called up for reinforcements to come and help us out, and we fought them on for a while until we got reinforcements, and, and then they were gone. One of the things that when I was after we went into a place called Ashaw Valley, and it was a heavy concentration of enemy there, and there was uh, we suffered a lot of casualties in Ashaw Valley. We were bivouacked on a hill. I can't I remember there was a it was a well known hill too, but I can't remember the name of it. And we would go down, and we would leave the hill and march down. I remember this distinctly because I, I, I said, boy, this is not good. And we marched down the valley. And one thing about, we, you know, we were out of water. We had to go down and get water. And they, and, and they marched our whole platoon down there, single file. And we got to the bottom of the hill. They opened up on us. And, man, I tell you what, that was a bloody battle. That was a, a lot of guys got killed in that skirmish. Yeah, I was fortunate that I didn't, but... 
I think three or four guys in my squad got killed. And out of platoon, they, but uh, that was uh, about 30% casualties in that skirmish. It, it, there were so many dead that each each guy that walked out of there had to carry a body out or drag or however you get it out. And we got back up to the hill and he put them in, in, in body bags. And it's it's kind of hard to imagine if you haven't done it. You know, it's not like the movies at all. Uh, you re it's like the old cowboy movies. You really can't hear bullets whiz over your head. I always thought that was a myth, but you can hear them. And uh, I mean, it depends on your environment. If you were in a village or something like that, um, you'd probably you'd try to identify which hut or building or structure it was coming from, and and focus your attention on that. If you're out in the jungle, you put you could knew about where it was coming from, but you don't normally see individual targets or things of that nature. And it's mass confusion. I think Eisenhower said in World War II, the, your, the best prepared battle plan isn't worth a damn the first, once the first round is fired. And it's pretty much true. You know, you got to remember, we're 18, 19, I think well trained. You come in on a helicopter, uh, I was a lot skinnier than maybe 150, 60 pounds. Uh, you got a steel helmet and a rifle, 80 pounds of gear. The helicopters want to get out of there because they're big targets. And they hover and you never know, that elephant grass might be two feet deep or eight feet deep. So they hover and you start jumping off the sides and you go down, your pack twists, you fall over, you lose your helmet, you drop your rifle, you get up, get yourself collected, and you're supposed to be moving on line, and you can't see the guy on either side of it. You can hear the bullets digging off the helicopters and whipping the elephant grass over your head, and so you just keep moving in what you hope is the right direction. And ultimately somehow it works out and everybody gets to the right place, usually. But when you're going in on a helicopter um, and you don't know what's going to be down there, that's when you got really the butterflies. They'd always what they call prep the LZs. He always had an M60 machine gun on each side. And usually we'd go on a Diamond 4 ship, they'd come in, and the minute you got down on the ground, the machine guns would start raking the whole horizon just in case anything was out there. So, I mean, you're going in, the helicopters are loud, four helicopters banging and chopping, guys jumping off, you know, and eight machine guns ripping around. So it's, it's pretty noisy and chaotic when you first first go in. I don't really remember too much about the actual work other than that we had to improvise a lot. We were given a lot of, you know, uh, IV antibiotics, starting a lot of IVs, and uh, and that's what a lot of our work days were, just, you know, IV fluids, IV antibiotics, changing dressings, you know, and writing letters for the GIs, uh, feeding them, you know, bathing them, talking to them, listening to them. Third Surgical Hospital, and mostly the post-op ward. If they needed extra help in the pre-op ward, you know, if they had a lot of a lot of casualties that came in, we would go to the pre-op ward too. And sometimes you work night and day, depending on the number of casualties that came in. It was not rare to go over 12 hours. But they tried, I mean, they had us on shifts and they tried not to let us go over 12 hours. I was second lieutenant when I first went in. And I made, I made first lieutenant uh, relatively fast. And one of the reasons was because I was in a major, I was working in a major role supervising the post op ward until they got a major there. And, um, I guess that's why they gave me the, the, the rank, I don't know. But anyway, I deserved it. <laughs> it's a reminder of home. And that's really what our job was. It's a reminder of home. It's to remember the girlfriend. It's to remember the sister, the cousin the girl they went to high school with, the reason they're there, you know, what are they fighting for? They're fighting for their country. They're fighting for freedom. They're fighting for democracy. Who represents that? You know, they're tired of seeing the guy, you know, they've been fixing that vehicle with or that they've been walking out in the jungle with. They want something different. Um, and that was the purpose. So we had the recreation center. The other part of the program was we made up these portable recreation programs
that lasted about an hour. And in an ideal world, we traveled to maybe five or six units, either on a landing zone, fire bases, out in the field, maybe even around a base camp. It varied. It depended on the unit you were with. When I transferred to Camp Eagle, which is uh, the home of the 101st, which was Air Mobile, and had a lot of helicopters available, we got out a lot. Um, so you made these programs, and say your subject was sports. Again, young men love sports. So let's say football. So you took flash cards, you made up these cards, and you held up a city. So you said Baltimore, and they yelled out Colts. And right there, we've dated ourselves. And then the second activity, maybe you named quarterbacks and what team they had to do. Another popular one was questions and answers. Who won Super Bowl three? And not only did they have to get the right answer, but you had to get it on a board and maybe make tic-tac-toe out of it. So you divided the men into two teams. Well, they got so engrossed in the game, they would forget where they are. They would forget their problems for an hour. And that was the purpose. And they did get engrossed. They would trip each other. They would steal the board so that even if the other team had the answer, they couldn't put it on the board because the board wasn't there to put it on. And I mean, again, Remember, they don't have television. You know, we were treated very nicely. I mean, you cannot imagine how many pulled out pictures. Anybody who had a, a, a girl or a woman with short, dark hair, I was her. I mean, it didn't matter if she was tall, short, fat, thin, black, white, um, Asian, Whatever, short dark hair, I became that woman. You know, the gals with long blonde hair, same same concept. And overall, no, I think when you consider the environment and everything else, for the most part, a lot of them were timid. You know, it was like, oh my God, it's a woman. What do I say? What do I do? Um, and the you know, once you might have visited a unit, like the idea was to visit a unit once a week. Um, and they got to know you more. You know, you could visit, you could talk, you know, they could say, oh, do you know what we have to do this week for inspection? Can you believe the Army is that stupid? Because we were an ear to listen. And it's a lot easier to tell it to someone than write a letter. Um, or, you know, relaying a story. Sometimes it was a sad story. I mean, you went back, someone wasn't there. You know, that was the hardest part. Out in these villages, it was uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of skin problems, a lot of things like TB, uh, plague, uh, all kinds of, of medical problems that you would treat. And if you could, you would uh, uh, get some of them back to, uh, to Quinion and, and they'd be seen there. You'd come in and, and, and you'd look over at the land and here would be these palm trees and this white beach and it just looked great. And then when you get close enough, you'd realize they used the beach for their toilet. And uh, so, I mean, it was... Things look good from a distance, but up close it was relatively grim. Uh, one interesting um, medcap, there's a leprosarium down the coast from us. And um, of course most of us had never seen leprosy before. So this, but we went down there quite uh, frequently and um, minor surgery and things like that. And it was a beautiful place. That was the, one of the cleanest places in Vietnam, and the houses were well kept up, and, and um, it was uh, nice to go there. And they had, um, there was still a Catholic priest there, and several Vietnamese nuns were there running this leprosarium. And um, I remember one day I was just chatting with one of them, and I, the, the hills around this place were, were full of VC. And 
They stayed away in the daytime when we were there, but at nighttime when we were gone, they came down into the into the village and took over essentially. And uh, if you um, gave them antibiotics or something, I'm sure the VC took a major portion of those for themselves. But I asked this this nurse. I said, you know, I don't know how this is going to work out. Uh, which side is going to come out on top? I said, I suppose it really won't make any difference to you. You'll just go on with your uh, job and, and task. And boy, she let me have it. <clears throat> She'd lost her whole family in Hue. Everybody else had been in the family had been killed by the Vietnamese communists. So, I mean, she had given everything, the only thing she had was, was this, this calling as a uh, nurse. Uh, the most remarkable story that I had was because we were there on December 31st, we were in one of the hotels downtown that sort of a, was a famous hotel. I honestly cannot remember the name. But we decided that we were going to go down, this is New Year's Eve, we were going to go down and have a drink. So we were um, down in the restaurant, in the bar area, and we were having our celebratory New Year's Eve together, and there were four of us, and we, um, all of a sudden, the there was um, somebody shot off firecrackers outside, obviously other, you know, people who celebrated New Year's Eve in that fashion, and this is the you know the New Year's Eve that's celebrated in, in the Western world. And the person who was the, at the desk, the clerk, reacted to the firecrackers by putting his hands over his head like this and screaming, "VC, VC, VC!" and ducking under the desk. And we were just speechless because that was his reaction to fireworks, that the Viet Cong was in fact bombing um, outside the hotel. So that was, that was a remarkable, you know, heart-stopping kind of. Nineteen seventy-five, fall of Saigon, bombs are going off all over. There's chaos. My grandmother um, was dying of tuberculosis, knew that she had to get me out of the country. Uh, picked me up. I, remi I remember riding in the back of a motorcycle, you know, with a guy and her, and we went to my brother's school to pick him up. Um, when we got there, though, I remember standing at the gates, screaming for him because the school was just rubble. There was nothing there. So I'm screaming for my brother, my grandmother is yelling at me, get back on, get back on the motorcycle, get back on, he's not here. And I remember trying to weave through traffic, there's just chaos, and there's bombs, and everybody's screaming. And she took me to a orphanage, Catholic orphanage, and uh, turned me over to the nuns and pretty much said goodbye. And I remember walking home with the nun that night to her apartment, walking over rubble and hopping and skipping, you know, not really knowing what's going on, kind of oblivious to it, but yet knowing what's, I don't know, it's kind of weird. I thought it was a new excitement adventure, you know. And then the next day, um, they put all of us kids on a bus, and as the bus was pulling away, it's kind of like a, a movie scene, my grandmother pulls up, and she's running after the bus trying to hand me a bag of food. You know, I'm leaning out the window screaming for her, and she's running after the bus, and never caught up with me. And we got to um, the airport, and got on a plane, and I remember stepping, going up to the plane, it was like a C-130, just a carrier. And looking back, and it was just, the whole airstrip was just full of women and kids, and women are just handing their kids to whomever will take them. I mean, just, I mean, just, I look back and just saw women crying and kids crying. It was just chaos. And women just shoving their kids to whomever's getting on the plane. And we sat on the plane, and there were no seats, it was just a carrier, so we sat on the floor. All of us huddling now, okay, now I'm scared. And uh, they did have, I guess, helpers there. And uh, I remember going to the bathroom, and we went through some turbulence, and I was so scared I couldn't get out of the bathroom, so they had to try to break down the door to get me out. 
Um, then we landed in the Philippines and stayed um, in the shelter there, the big air hangar, and was just empty with just tons of people just laying all over, all of us kids. And uh, they uh, lined us up, boys on one line, girls on another line, and as we walked through this line and past this table, they handed us out a name card. And that's how I got the name Susan. My original name was Twee, Winty Twee. And uh, so thank goodness I could have been like a Gertrude or a Mildred or <laughs> something. But I got the name Susan and we had to wear it around our neck. Um, got back on the plane and we landed somewhere else that was nice and warm. Um, and I really don't remember much more after that until I got sent to Colorado Springs, Colorado, where um, I was taken in by a foster family and stayed with them for a couple months. And then my adopted parents um, were actually, they were both in the military and uh, met over in Vietnam, um, came back to the States, got married, and were actually on their honeymoon. And um, they had decided they wanted to adopt a Vietnamese child. They didn't care boy, girl, what age. And they were on their honeymoon and got a phone call that there's a seven-year-old girl ready for adoption. Do they want her? They had five minutes to decide. And they said, yep, we'll take her. And he sighted the scene. So they packed up their stuff. They were vacationing in Montana. Packed up their stuff, drove down to Colorado and picked me up. And uh, um, he was still in the military, so we traveled. I was very fortunate to be able to travel the whole world again with my father. When we got blown over, um, all my records, who my mother was, my birth record, who, you know, maybe who my father was, all my personal stuff was um, put on a plane that was before mine. And that one got shot down. So I came here. I don't even know my birthday. I don't know the day I was born, you know, and I was talking to some of my friends last night about it, and it's like, you know how, everyone knows their birthday, everyone knows the day they're born, and I don't, I'll never be able to find out, that's why I don't read horoscopes, <laughs> it doesn't do any good for me. Departure is the same as coming in. And went again, went through the replacement uh, uh, depot uh, when you're processing out, got on the airplane, and, and uh, we were taking off. Again, flying back to Japan and then back to uh, Seattle. It, what really struck me is that when you take off, there's the obligatory celebration that you're leaving. And so people are hooting and hollering and cheering and what have you. And... Uh, Again, I was sitting close to the front of the airplane. Well, to make sure things didn't get out of hand, you know, I, I stood up and walked the aisle and uh, made sure everybody was calm, get, you know, fasten your safety, belt, safety belts, working with the stewardess to make sure that everybody would behave themselves. You know, as walking through the airplane, what really struck me, there were empty seats. When I went over, the plane was full. When I come back, there were empty seats. It went after, remember walking up to the front of the airplane and I was going to ask the question, why are there empty seats? And I didn't, and I sat down and finally just said, hey, this is really a stupid question. You know, because again, the person down worked with was with grave registration. We knew all these bodies were going back. That's what really struck me, that there was a heck of a high cost to this. Um, you know, I came over in an airplane full, when went home on an airplane that wasn't full. You know, those people either died or were evacuated early. You know, so that that really comes down into a shock job. But it really wasn't until my second tour into Thailand when I was, uh, again, logistical support. And that was uh, for the refugee re relief out of Cambodia, Laos, U.S. forces in Thailand uh, that uh, received a letter from that I would, in the meantime I had gotten married and received a letter from my wife that the local school had closed down because they didn't have fuel. This would be 72, 73. And yet watching all the B-52s take off and the same, we're just burning up an inordinate amount of natural resources here. But yet there was a school in Iowa that was closed because they didn't have money enough to, or didn't have fuel to heat the building. And it was like, this is really stupid.
our son, up until recently, uh, we always asked, well, what do you remember about your dad coming back home? Because we went to meet him at the Offutt, or Omaha Air Force, or Air Base. No, airport, that's it. And uh, we went there, and people were kind of strange at that time. And Doug was told not to wear his uniform home because uh, sometimes there would be problems. Well, he told them that he would wear his uniform back. He fought for it. He had a right to be proud of it. So he comes in, and the kids all looked, and being that he was so skinny and so green-looking, they almost didn't recognize him. But when he came up and he talked with them and he hugged me and they, they kind of sat there and looked and it took us a while before we walked down the uh, area to go out and people started calling him names and spitting on him and telling him he was dirt. And uh, my boy, he just seven years old, or well, by that time he was eight. Why are they doing that, Mom? Daddy didn't do nothing to them. And it's hard to explain to an eight-year-old what's wrong with people. And up until about five years ago, that was the thing he remembered of his dad coming home.